Dimensions of Prophecy. Welcome again to Countdown, Dimensions of Prophecy. Our topic, 3,000 Years to Accomplish a Cover-Up, deals with many things we take for granted, the origin of many things we look upon as being Christian. We will go back again to Babylon, the city built by Nimrod, a city inhabited by people who prior to Babylon's existence had lived in the hills for security from the wild animals that roamed the plains. How did these people come to worship Nimrod as a god? Do you remember when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments? The people had made themselves a golden calf to worship. Where did the idea of a golden calf come from, and who did it represent? Have you ever eaten hot cross buns, ever wondered where they came from? And what about the 40 days of Lent? Well, I'm sure you'll enjoy our topic today, 3,000 years to accomplish a cover-up. Let's go now to Kenneth Cox. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're very happy to welcome each of you back tonight. When our country was being settled, people were moving west. <clears throat> Many times there was disagreements, misunderstandings between the settlers and the Indians. Language wasn't understood and therefore many times they just weren't able to understand one another and to communicate. And because of that, many times serious disagreements broke out. The Indians felt like the settlers were coming in, taking over the land, killing the game, making life hard for them. And therefore, sometimes these Indians would raid the villages. When they came in and raided the villages, there were times when they took some of the men of the village captive. They'd take them back to their camps. And there they would have warriors line up, two long lines of warriors. And they would stand this man in the front of that line. And they would tell him that if he could run down between those two lines of warriors, armed with knives and tomahawks, could get to the other end alive he would be free to go back home. 
Now, if he didn't want to run, uh, then he took his life in a very slow, painful way. Many of the men tried to run, a few of them, able to run like the wind, dodge like a rabbit, got to the end alive and went back home to tell about it. This became known in history as running the gauntlet. And what I'm trying to tell you tonight is every one of you, doesn't make any difference who you are, every last one of us are running a gauntlet. Oh, true enough. We're not faced with Indian warriors who are armed with knives and tomahawks, but the scripture does say this. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers and against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. True, we're not faced with warriors, but dear friends, you and I tonight are running the gauntlet of temptation. That we are running, everyone. And the devil is after every individual. It says that he's going about seeking whom he may devour. In fact, as Jesus was talking to Peter, he said this to Simon Peter. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brethren. Said Peter, the devil wants you. And he might take you and sift you as wheat, but I have prayed that your what? What? Your faith won't fail. It'll be strong. Dear friend, tonight, you and I are running that gauntlet of temptation, and let me tell you, if you try to run it of your own strength, you can't make it. Impossible. That's why the Bible says you've got to put on the whole armor of God. It's necessary. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. By the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. That's the only way that we can make it is by putting on the armor of God. If you try to run that gauntlet of your own power and your own strength without the armor of God, you can't make it, friends. Impossible. And the only way that you and I have surety, that we have hope, is by putting on the armor of God, and that is by getting into the Word of God going to have to get into the scripture. You remember that little poem that I've mentioned to you that says, what says the Bible? The blessed Bible. This my only question be, the teachings of men so often mislead us. What says the Bible to me? That's what we want to find out. Tonight, we're not going to be concerned. At least I hope that you can kind of just par away and forget them but not concerned necessarily with our feelings. Most of us are creatures of feelings. But I hope tonight we can just open up our hearts and take a look at God's Word and see exactly what God's Word says. Because tonight we're going to go way back and we're going to trace some things right down through the Scripture. We're going to go way back to the beginning. And it says here, clear back in the beginning, that God created an angel. This angel's name was Lucifer highest angel in all of heaven. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. He was over all the angelic hosts. The anointed cherub meant that he stood right beside the throne of God. Goes on saying this about him. Thou wast perfect in thy way from the day thou wast created till iniquity. This being that he had created, God had made with his own hands, wanted to become God. In fact, in the book of Thessalonians, it tells us, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. The man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, referring to Lucifer. Now listen who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, 
so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is what? God. This being that God had created, that God made, it, made wanted to be God. And as a result of that, we find that war took place up in heaven. This being that God made became what you and I know today to be the devil or Satan. This is what he became. And it says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. They did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. And the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now, dear friends, when the devil and his angels were cast out to this earth, he didn't change. He still wanted to be God. And you find immediately he begins to set up a whole system whereby he can be God. And that's what we're going to take a look at tonight because we're looking at the very basis of the condition of what's happening in this old world. And dear friend, whether we like it or whether we don't, you find yourself on one side or the other. That's just the way it is. Listen to what it says here in the book of Genesis. And Cush begot Nimrod began to be a mighty one in the earth. So it says that this man Cush had a son by the name of Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty individual in the earth. Let me take just a moment to tell you why. Nimrod was a great hunter, as we're going to see in the next text. That was important back then because the animals, after sin came in, became vicious. And the people suffered many times from these animals. And so someone who was a great hunter was revered very much by the people. It goes on and says, He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, Even as Nimrod the mighty hunter before the Lord. Now that text in the Hebrew doesn't do too much in English that way. But in Hebrew it implies that this man Nimrod was against. God, not with God, but contrary to God, was rebellious is actually what it implies in Hebrew, and it says that Nimrod was a mighty individual, and it goes on and says that he began many of the cities, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and it named other cities. Now, the reason Nimrod also became so famous among the people is he started building walls around cities. This provided protection for the people from animals, from warriors, from this type of thing. And so Nimrod became a very great person, and it says that one of the cities that he started was Babel. Now, if you have a Bible that has what is called a center margin in it, right down the center, if you look that text up, right beside that word Babel, you'll find a little letter. And if you look that letter up in the center margin, it'll say Babylon. In other words, Nimrod was the one that began the city of Babylon. The people revered him. They thought he was a very, very great person. When Nimrod died, his wife, Semiramis, took his body and threw it into the river, told the people that her husband had gone to the sun and was now the god of the sun. And so you find that all the people in Babylon begin to worship the sun. The sun was looked upon them as the great god, and they worshiped every move that the sun made. You see, they worship the sun as a god of victory, a god of, of uh, victorious type of thing that let out. It always went forward, never went backwards. It was a god of conquest, and they worshiped it as such. They believed that Nimrod was that god. It wasn't too long after the death of 
Nimrod, that you find that things begin to happen. You see, you find that we have in the scripture and in history the flood. Now notice what it says here about it. It says in Genesis 11, 4, And they said, Come, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Now, you remember, they decided they were going to build this tower in case there came another flood. They could crawl up in it, and that way they could be saved. At least some of them, it wouldn't destroy everybody. You remember, the Lord did not look upon that with pleasure, and it says that he confounded the languages. People begin to speak different languages. When people begin to speak different languages, they continued to worship the same pagan gods, except now they had different names. Instead of calling him Nimrod, some of them called him Baal. Some of them referred to him as Baal Peor. Others referred to him as Zor. But it's all the same God, the God of the sun. Same God. After Nimrod had died, a few months later, his wife, Semiramis, became pregnant. She told the people that her husband was in the sun and he was the God of the sun. And so, when she became pregnant, and she told them that she had conceived from her spirit husband in the sun, the people also begin to worship her as a goddess. They begin to worship her as a goddess of love. And when the languages were dis confounded, then they called her also by different names. She became known as Semiramis. Others referred to her as Venus, the goddess of what? Love. Others referred to her as Diana. Does that strike a bell with any of you? Huh? You remember reading in your Bible when Paul went to the city of Ephesus and the silversmiths were worshipped there and they said, Great is our goddess Diana. Same one. Others referred to her as Ashtaroth, Ashtar, all the same goddess, the goddess of fertility or a goddess of love. Now, she gave birth to a boy that she named Pamuz. They believed that since this boy had been born from Nimrod in the sun and Semiramis, they also deified him, and they began to worship him as a god of fertility or a god of reproduction. Now, I've given you a little background into some ancient history. If you want to read further about it, then I invite you to go to the Baptist bookstore, buy a book called The Two Babylons by Hislop. You might go to the library and buy some books called The Egyptian Books of the Dead, but there's a lot of books that tell about this. It gives the background on it. There's much I could say about this. I'm not going to tonight. If you would just permit yourself and do a little thinking, you would begin to see something. You could begin to see that the devil had set up in pagan belief the exact counterfeit of the birth of Jesus Christ. Much here. I don't have time to go into all that. What I want to do tonight is I want to show you the influence of this upon God's people down through time. We're going to bring it right up to today and show you the influence, what's happening. You see, I think all of you remember that there was a man by the name of Abraham. Remember Abraham, don't you? Right. And you remember Abraham had a son by the name of Isaac? Yeah, you remember Isaac. And you remember Isaac had a son by the name of Jacob? Remember that? Okay. And you remember Jacob had 12 sons. One of those sons' name was Joseph. You remember that? Okay. You remember 
Joseph did some things he probably shouldn't have done, and his brothers didn't like him very well. You remember that? And his father sent him off to visit his brothers to take them some things to eat while they were herding sheep. And you remember, they decided to sell him. They was going to kill him first, and one of the brothers talked him out of that. And they sold him to a caravan of Ishmaelites that are, were on their way down to Egypt. Joseph was taken down to Egypt, placed on an auction block, and auctioned off. And you remember, Potiphar bought him. And Joseph evidently worked very hard, uh, did well. Potiphar trusted him, thought a lot of him. And then you remember Potiphar's wife decided she also liked him and tried to seduce him. And when he wouldn't go along with that, she accused him of rape and he was thrown in prison. In prison, the Pharaoh had a butler and a baker that uh, he didn't trust and had them thrown in prison. And uh, while they were in prison, they had a dream. And Joseph interpreted those dreams for them. He told the baker that his head was going to be cut off. Told the butler that he would be reinstated to his position. And then he told the butler, he said, when you are, remember me. And true to Jacob's interpretation, or Joseph's interpretation, excuse me. The baker was executed and the butler was put back in his position and evidently the butler forgot him because it said two years passed. And then Pharaoh had a dream and no one could interpret the dream and all of a sudden the butler remembered. And he had the Pharaoh called Joseph and Joseph interpreted the dream and told him what was going to happen in Egypt. And you remember... The Pharaoh made Joseph the prime minister of Egypt. Now, I'm giving you some background because we're coming to something. Then, you remember, as time passed, they were having a famine down in Canaan, and Jacob has sent his sons up to Egypt to buy corn, and do you know who they have to buy it from? Yeah, from Joseph. And you remember after a period of reconciliation, then, Joseph sends his brothers back to Canaan to get their father. And the whole family, all the sons and their father and their wives and their children and all, come to Egypt, some 80 of them. And because of Joseph's favor with the Pharaoh, he gives them the land of Goshen. And Israel moves into the land of Goshen and settles down. Things go along quite well for a number of years. And the nation of Israel begins to grow. Eighty people. And it grows and it grows and it grows. But then one day, there comes a Pharaoh that doesn't know Joseph. And all the children of Israel go into bondage. And dear friends, when you go over to Egypt today, and you see some of those pyramids and all. Many of those were built by Hebrew slave labor. That's how they were built. 400 years they were in Egypt and a large portion of that in slavery. And they beg and they plead God to release them, let them go. And finally God calls a man by the name of Moses. And he tells Moses, Go down there and let, tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And you remember, Moses went there and he worked and he worked and he worked. And after ten plagues, finally, Pharaoh decides to let him go. They get out in the desert and they arrive at the Red Sea. And Pharaoh changes his mind, tries to go and call them back, bring them back into captivity. And God opens the Red Sea and they cross. And when Pharaoh and his army tries, they're drowned in the Red Sea. Now, Israel is out in the Sinai Desert. They arrive at Mount Sinai. Now here God has permitted 
a nation to grow. There are a million and a half of them now. And God is going to take this nation and out of this nation, he's going to make a great people to take the message of his love to the whole world. That's God's intention. They arrive at Mount Sinai. God tells Moses, come up into the mountain. And Moses goes up into the mountain where he spends some 40 days with the Lord. Oh, he hasn't been gone but about a week when some of the men of Israel come to Aaron, Moses' brother, and they say, Aaron, where's Moses? Aaron said, well, Moses, oh, he, he went up there on the mountain. He's talking to the Lord. They say, are you sure? And he said, sure, I'm sure. He'll be back in just a little bit. And they say, well, fine. Another week passes, no Moses. And they go to Aaron and they say, Aaron, where's Moses? He said, well, Moses is gone, but he'll be back. Won't be long. And they say, are you sure he's coming back? He said, oh, yes, he's coming back. Another week passes. No Moses. And those men go to Aaron and they say, listen, Aaron, Moses has run off and left us out here in this desert. He's not coming back. He's run off. He's not going to come back. And Aaron said, oh, no, Moses is coming back. Another week passes. No Moses. And finally, those men of Israel go to Aaron and they say, listen, Aaron, Moses isn't coming back. He's not coming back. He ran off and left us out here in this desert to starve. Tell you what, you take this gold we give you and you make us a golden calf and we'll worship it. Up in the mountain, God sees what's going on and this is what happens. The Lord said unto Moses, Go get thee down. For thy people whom thou hast brought us out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They've turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. And they have made a melted calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed thereunto and said, These are thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Let me ask you, where in the world did they ever get the idea of worshipping a golden calf? Where did they ever get that? Huh? You think they just conjured that up out of their mind? No. You see, the Egyptians worshipped the bull calf as one of their gods of fertility. They had seen the Egyptians for years, 400 years they've seen them worship these gods. And so now here, they are worshipping these gods. And right back in the beginning, Nimrod and all of them set up gods of love and gods of fertility. They said, this will be our God. You will worship, we'll worship it. Listen to what happened. And it came to pass as soon as he came near unto the camp. Now, Moses coming down out of the mount, mount. He saw the calf and the dancing and Moses' anger burned and he cast the tables out of his hand and broke them beneath the mount. Here he's coming down on the mount and he sees these people worshiping that golden calf and he takes those Ten Commandments that God has written on with his own finger and he throws them down and breaks them to pieces. Why? Why? Didn't Moses know they were worshiping the golden calf? Didn't he know that? Sure he did. God told him that up on top of the mountain. So why would he get all upset when he saw it? Because this is what they were doing. When Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked under their shame among their enemies. You see, they were out there dancing around that calf without any clothes on. It's part of their worship of this God of fertility or this God of reproduction. Now listen as it continues. And then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and he said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. Now Moses stood there and he said, All of you that want to serve the Lord, come over here. Now many, many people came of every tribe, but only of the tribe of Levi did every man, woman, and child come over on the side of the Lord. That's the reason God made him the priest. 
Now, what happens isn't very pretty. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out throughout the, from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. He said, If they want to worship these golden calves, slay them. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. 3,000 of them said, No, we're going to worship this golden calf. And God said, No, you aren't. You see, the devil right there was going to put an end to what God was trying to do. He was going to stop it right there. And God said, No, you're not. 3,000 of them lost their lives. Now, you would think that the children of Israel would have said, Well, okay, that's good enough. We're not going to worship this golden calf any longer. But listen what happened. And Israel abode in Siddim, and the people began to commit harlotry with the daughters of Moab. Now they get down to the country of Moab, and here they do the same thing all over. Now listen. And they called the people unto the sacrifice of their gods, and the people did eat and bow down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Baal Peor is the sun god. And all the harlotry that they were committing with the women of Moab had to do with their worship of the sun god. It all went together. Things that I can't even say tonight. That was part of their worship. And God's anger was kindled against Israel, and this is what happened. The Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. He said, If these people want to worship the sun, then you cut off their heads and you hang them up facing the sun. And those that died in the plague were 20 and 4,000. Now, dear friends, I'm on a serious subject tonight because the subject I'm on has to deal with the conflict that's going on between God and Satan. And the devil is saying right here, he's got the children of Israel out there, and he said, okay, we're going to mess this whole thing up right here. Now, those people didn't have to go out in the wilderness. They were out in the wilderness of their own choice. They didn't have to leave Egypt. But they're out there, and now they're saying, well, <laughs> we're going to worship Baal Peor, and God said, no, you're not, and 24,000 of them died. Now, I'm taking you tonight, step by step through the Scripture, show you what happened. You remember a man by the name of Gideon? You remember his band of 300? Well, let's read something about him. Then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord, called it Jehovah Shalom. Unto this day it is yet an orphra of the Aborites. Now, listen to what happened. It came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath, and cut down the images that are by it. Now, if you read the scripture, you'll find that Israel worshipped Baal, which was the sun god. Not only did they worship Baal, but beside the altar of Baal, they had a grove of trees in which they kept images also where they carried on all their immorality that went with the worship of Baal. That's what's here. That's what Gideon's father has as an altar to Baal in this grove of trees. And God has said, Gideon, cut it down. Then Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had said unto him. And so it was because he feared his father's household and the men of the city that he could not do it by day, that he did it by night. Went over there, cut all that stuff down. Now, you see, they always built the altar of Baal at the highest place they could find. If there was a mountain round, they built it up on top of the mountain. If there was no mountains, they built it on top of the tallest building because that way they could get up early in the morning and they could go and they could worship the sun as it arose. That's why this text says, And when the men of the city arose early in the morning, 
Behold, the altar of Baal was cast down and the images were cut down that were by it and the second bullock was offered upon the altar that was built. And Gideon had much to do of stopping the worship of Baal, the sun god in Israel. Part of the work that he did. But let's continue on. We're just tracing it right down through the Old Testament. You remember there was a king in Israel by the name of Ahab. Ahab married a woman by the name of Jezebel. Now listen, because it tells you this about it. And Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord above all who were before him. And dear friends, that covers a lot of ground when it says that. And it came to pass if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, that he took as his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, the king of the Zedouans, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. Now, Jezebel's father, Ethbaal, was not only the king of the Zedouans, but he was the high priest of the temple of Baal. He had been named Ethbaal. Last part of his name was after the sun god. He also named his daughter Jezebel after the sun god. And when they got through with Ahab, he forsook the Lord. This is what happened. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made an idol, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. Absolutely forsook the Lord, refused to serve him, served Baal. And God sent a prophet by the name of Elijah. And he said, you go tell Ahab and Jezebel if they don't change their ways, it won't rain for three and a half years. Ahab just had him thrown out of the court. But it didn't rain for three and a half years. And after three and a half years, Elijah came back and told Ahab, if the Lord is God, Worship him, and if Baal is God, worship him. So they went up on the top of Mount Carmel, and there Elijah told them, you build an altar here for Baal, and you put a sacrifice on it, and you pray to Baal that he'll send fire from heaven down, burn up this sacrifice. All morning long they prayed. Nothing happened. About 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Elijah said, that's enough. And he went over and he rebuilt the altar of God. He went over on the edge of the mountain and he prayed. He said, the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob, if thou be the God of Israel, send fire down and burn up this sacrifice. And the scripture says, that fire fell from heaven and it burned up the sacrifice, burned up the wood, burned up the stone and leaving licked up water that was in the ditch. And all of Israel fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. You see, Elijah got them to turn from worshiping Baal, the sun god. Now we come on down a little farther in time. In fact, to the book of Jeremiah. And before we go into that, I might say here that some of you may be like the lady that was listening to the preacher. And every time the preacher got on something that she just particularly, you know, agreed with and it touched her heart, she would say, Amen. Amen. And pretty soon he had hit something else and she would say, Amen. And then all of a sudden the preacher got on something that just didn't agree with her at all, you know, just kind of cut her to the heart rather than her being happy about it. And she said, ooh we he's quit preaching and started meddling. And that's the way some of you may feel now because we're going to get close home, I'm going to tell you right now, very close home. And notice what it has to say here in Jeremiah. It says, therefore, pray not for this people, neither lift up crying or prayer for them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear thee. God's talking to Jeremiah. He said, Jeremiah, don't pray for these people. Just don't pray for them anymore because I'm not going to hear you. Now, what are they doing that's so bad? 
See thou not what they do in the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem? What are they doing? The children gather wood. Fathers kindle the fire. The women knead their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven to pour out drink offerings unto other gods that they may provoke me to anger. Now, what were they doing? Making cakes to the God of heaven said it provoked the Lord to anger. Do they provoke me to anger, saith the Lord? Do they not provoke themselves to the confusion of their own faces? What were they doing? Oh, they were just making a little cake. And in that, on that cake, they were putting a tea on it for the god Tammuz, and they were offering it as a sacrifice. You ever heard of hot cross buns? Don't come from this book. That isn't where they come from. They were just a pagan custom that the church Christianized and handed it to people as a Christian custom. Now, I'm talking tonight about a cover-up. I'm talking about things that were covered up and slid under the door and handed to you and I as Christian customs. That's what I'm talking about. So I told you I'm going to get close home. You want to keep going? Okay. You made the decision. We'll keep going. Let's go to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel, the 8th chapter, verse 5. Then said he unto me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now the way towards the north. So I lifted up my eyes in the way towards the north, and behold, northward at the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entrance. Now, what the prophet's saying is he went to the sanctuary, and right there in the entrance of the sanctuary, they had erected an image of a pagan god. That's what he's saying. He referred to it as an image of jealousy. He said, Furthermore unto me, Son of man, see thou what they do, even the great abominations that the house of Israel commit here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary, but turn yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. He said, Worse than this. Now let's see what they're doing. He brought me to the door of the court, and when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. So here he gets to the wall of the court. Here's a hole in it. And then he said unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I digged in the wall, behold, a door. So here's a secret entrance into God's sanctuary. And this is what he finds. And he said unto me, Go in and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping thing, an abominable beast, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. Here he walks into God's sanctuary that God had literally given instruction to Moses how to build, and there on the wall they had all these different beasts that there were gods of fertility to them. The pagans, they had those on the wall all around about. Terrible, worshiping these gods of fertility right there in God's own sanctuary. So listen as he continues. He said unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. And then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was towards the north. And behold, there sat the women weeping for Tammuz. Let me tell you a little about it, Tammuz. You see, they believed that Tammuz was a god of fertility, a god of reproduction. They believed that Tammuz died every fall as the grass turned brown trees lost their leaves. All of nature and reproduction began to go dormant. They believe it did because Tammuz died. They believed he was the god of reproduction. They also believed that every spring Tammuz would come back to life. As the grass began to green up, the trees begin to leave out, the birds are singing, Produ reproduction is plentiful all through nature. They believed that this was a sign that Tammuz had come back to life. So every year, 
40 days before the sun reaches the vernal equinox that begins spring, they had 40 days of weeping for Tammuz to come back to life. You ever heard of Lent? Doesn't come from here, friends. Not out of this book. It was the 40 days of weeping for Tammuz to come back to life that the church just took and slid it on the rug and Christianized it and handed to us as a Christian custom. Doesn't come from this book. That's why you have 40 days of Lent for them to people to afflict their souls takes place 40 days before the sun reaches the earth vernal equinox. That's where it came from. You want me to continue on? Tammuz, as I mentioned, was the son of Nimrod, Semiramis. They believed that Semiramis conceived Tammuz about last of March, 1st of April. And all the pagans believed that Thomas was born on December the 25th. That happens to be where we get Christmas. Oh, it doesn't come out of Scripture. Christ wasn't born December the 25th. No way. In fact, I was in Israel right about that time last year. I'll be in Israel close to that time this year. Christ wasn't born then. We know when Christ was born. Christ was born in the early fall. It's not hard to know when Christ was born. We don't know the day, but it's not hard to know the time of the year because it says very clearly that he was born six months after John the Baptist, and it tells you the month John the Baptist was born in. So it's not hard for us to have a pretty good idea of at least the month in which Jesus was born. It wasn't. It was early fall. It wasn't December the 25th. But we just merely took a pagan custom, Christianized it, and said, that's okay. All right. Now, don't misunderstand me, folks. I don't really see any harm in remembering a day in honor of the birth of Christ. I don't see any harm in that. I don't see any harm in giving gifts. I don't see where that's harmful to anybody. I do have some real trouble sometimes understanding that we celebrate a day in honor of the birth of Christ and we give everybody gifts except the Lord. I have a little trouble with that. Also, it may come as a shock to you. It happens to be where we also get Easter from. It doesn't come from the Scripture. It comes from the goddess Esther, Semiramis. That's where we get the word Easter from. Now, if you're having a little trouble believing that, then maybe you can answer some questions for me. Because ever since I was a little boy, I always wanted to know what Easter eggs and bunny rabbits had to do with the resurrection of Christ. You see, they are symbols of fertility, the worship of these gods. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong and remember in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, what I think is wrong, dear friends, is us intermixing, if you please, paganism and Christianity. That I have real trouble with. I think we need to get clear on what we believe. But the scripture continues on. And he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. He said, Worse than all this, watch. He brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar were about five and twenty men with their backs towards the temple of the Lord and their faces towards the east, and they worshiped the sun towards the east. Here they were in God's own house in a temple with their backs to it and worshiping the sun. Worse than all that, God said. Worse than... What they were doing with Semiramis, worse than anything else, was their worship of the sun. Israel worshiped the sun 
until finally they were carried off into captivity, the Babylonian captivity. When they came out of the Babylonian captivity, you don't find them worshiping the sun anymore. There were several kings in Israel who tried to get them to stop. One of those kings was a king by the name of Hezekiah. It says this about him. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Now God sent the king a message and said, You need to get things in order, you're going to die, you're not going to live. And that king just couldn't accept that. The Bible says that he turned his face over against the wall and wept pled with the Lord not to die. Now, friends, let me tell you something. God wasn't trying to be hard on this man. God wasn't trying to be unkind or unmerciful. God was trying to be loving and kind and merciful because there were certain things that were fixing to take place in Israel that that king would have been much better off to have never known happened. So God in his kindness was going to say, okay, get your house in order. But that king couldn't accept that. You and I need to learn to accept some things. You know, we don't need to be going around putting question marks where God puts periods. We shouldn't be doing that. But nevertheless, he pled with God not to die, and so God said, okay, Isaiah, you go back and tell Hezekiah, I'll give him 15 more years. 15 years he probably wished he had never seen. But nevertheless, Isaiah went back and told him, said, the Lord's going to give you 15 more years. Hezekiah said, how can I know? How do I know that God will do that? And Isaiah said, the sundial out there in the courtyard, you want the shadow on it to go forward or to go backwards? And Hezekiah answered, it's a light thing for the shadow to go down 10 degrees, which meant forward as the sun was going down. Nay, but let the shadow return backward 10 degrees. Have it go the other way. And the old sun stopped dead still and moved backwards 10 degrees. Now, dear friends, down in Babylon, those people worship every move that the sun makes. I mean, it's their great conquering hero. It always goes forward never goes backwards, and all of a sudden it stops dead. Moves backwards 10 degrees. It took those people up in Babylon so bad that they sent an envoy up to see Hezekiah to ask what was going on. Howbeit in the business of the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, who sent unto him to inquire of the wonder that was done in the land. They said, who is this God that is absolutely so great that he can stop our God and move him backwards. You see, they watched every move that took place. As Israel came out of the Babylonian captivity, they evidently finally got that clear that they weren't going to worship the sun anymore, and they didn't, although they did a lot of other things that was worse. But after they crucified Jesus Christ, rejected the Son of God, and we move into the Christian era, the Gentiles, do you know what they are in belief? They're pagans. They worship the sun. They worship these gods of fertility. And the Christian believers are preaching to them to turn from their worship of these gods. And Christianity has grown until almost half of the Roman Empire is Christian. There's an emperor at this time by the name of Constantine. Constantine sees that it would be politically advantageous for him to accept Christianity. So he tells the people he had a dream, and in the dream he saw a cross, and that he was going to accept Christianity. 
took his army, marched them through the river and told them they had all been baptized and were Christians now. Since the pagans worshiped the sun, they worshiped the sun on a day that was given in honor of the sun called Sunday. So to make Christianity more appealing to the pagans, in A.D. 321, Constantine signed the Edict of Constantine in which he said Christians would no longer worship on the Sabbath, but they would worship on the day of the sun. And thus you have a change that took place in Christians begin to worship on Sunday, the day of the sun, rather than on the Sabbath. That's what happened. That's what brought about the change. I'm talking about a cover-up, friends. I'm talking about things that were just slid under the door, handed to you and me, and our forefathers, our parents, have been handed it down through time, not based on Scripture, but based on an action made by a Roman emperor and handed to you and I as a Christian custom that really has its origin in paganism. What do we do about it? I would like to offer you the words of Jesus. This is simply what disciples said, the other disciples, excuse me, Peter, and the other disciples, apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than who? Man. Now, dear friends, the book's there. All God is asking you and I to do is to follow him. You see, I'm talking about a question of faith. Faith demands that you and I take what Scripture says, walking with the Lord, following him. That's what it's all about. I want you to listen as Phil and Joey sing, Trusting is Believing. you to take your green ticket books, turn to the white pages with me. If you need a white slip, 
then the ushers will hand you a white container and in that container are some white slips and also some pencils if you need a pencil. Three questions I'd like for you to look at with me. 